Well, I think we'll get started. It's uh, 10 30 my watch. So, um, thanks everybody for joining. My name is uh, Jack Deckers. I'm a <clears throat> professor in animal breeding and genetics uh, um, at Iowa State University, and I'm a co PD on the uh, Ag um, 2PI project um, and, and uh, leading the, the field day um, organization. Um, should also mention uh, Nicole Scott, who, the, the program coordinator who is on, and he, he, he does all the work behind the scenes. Um, and Eddie does a lot of the technical work. Um, and um, so, yeah, today we're uh, this, this will be our fifth field day already. Uh, and we're going to hear about advances in field and control environment phenotyping at Purdue University, uh, hear what they've developed there. And we have two. Uh, Two speakers, but only one of them may be speaking, uh, Dr. Mitch Tangstra and Dr. Yang Yang. Um, at Purdue, they're having some uh, technical difficulties with, uh, with the internet uh, system. And so uh, uh, Dr. Yang is not able to uh, join through internet, only through phone. So uh, Dr. Tangstra may be giving the whole uh, presentation. So a little bit of background on uh, these two. Um, so Mitch is a professor of plant breeding and genetics at and the Wickerson Chair of Excellence in Agricultural Research at Purdue University. And he also serves there as the uh, scientific, scientific director of the Institute for Plant Sciences. And Dr. Yang Yang is the director of the Di digital phenomics at Purdue University, where he oversees the operation and development of the Indiana uh, Corn and Soybean Innovation Center and the Controlled Environment Phenotyping Facility. And we're excited to hear about what they have uh, have to share with us. Uh, and, and Mitch promised that uh, it's not, not, not only going to be plants, there's going to be some animals in there too. So, so Mitch, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, But before I do, um, just for all of you, if you have uh, questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, as soon as you have the question, now we may wait. There's going to be a break about halfway, where we'll have uh, um, some time for questions, which then we'll uh, we'll read out. But if there are questions that are pertinent to, you know, what's being talked about at that point, then I'll interject and uh, and and ask the question right there. So if you have a question, put it in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll cover it. So Mitch, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, Jack, thank you so much for um, introducing me. It's not often I get a, a, a formal Dutch translation or a Dutch uh, Nederlands friendly translation of my last name. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole, can I share my screen? Yeah, do you not have access? Oh, perfect. Sorry about that. No worries. So I presume you can see my uh, PowerPoint okay. Uh, if, it, if there is a, it's hard to see this when you're presenting in the chat side. So if anybody, or if there's a Jack or Nicole, if you see any chat questions that need to be addressed, feel free to call them out. Uh, I don't mind being interrupted during my presentation either if someone wants to jump in uh, with a live question. So today, uh, <clears throat> originally, Yang and I were gonna present this as a tag team, but our whole system, our whole, um, uh, internet connectivity on campus is down at the moment. So Dr. Yang can't log in from home. So I'll be doing the presentation, uh, but he's online on, on the telephone and we'll be able to answer questions. We're gonna try to have a couple of breaks in the presentation. The first break is gonna happen after we talk about our facilities. So it'll be facility centric. On the front end of the talk, we'll have a little break. And if there's some questions, I'm glad Dr. Yang is on. He knows a lot more about the hardware than I do. And, um, but between the two of us, hopefully we can answer your questions. And then we're gonna go through a series of case studies of how these uh, advances and the, how this infrastructure is contributing to research across the, across the university in the second half of the talk. And at the end of that, we'll have another break and we can hopefully have some time at the end to do some uh, Q and A and, and talk about opportunities for uh, phenomics. In, in science, particularly in my interest or my area of, of expertise is in plant science. But as Jack said, I do have a picture of an animal, uh, a couple of animals I think here today, and we'll get to those in the second half of the talk. So our, our phenomics research activities on campus are, are largely supported through an investment in 
the Institute for Plant Sciences. The Institute for Plant Sciences was uh, initiated with an investment from our president, Mitch Daniels, in 2013. He invested uh, more than $20 million in a plant science research initiative, or a plant science initiative, both research and academics. That was really around four basic pillars in the proposal. The first pillar was around academics. How do we uh, enhance our, our programs in terms of educating the next generation of plant scientists? This includes uh, programs for high school students, bringing them to campus uh, before they've made a decision on exactly what they want to do. It includes hiring 10 new basic plant science faculty members across the College of Agriculture and using that, uh, that group, uh, that core group of basic plant, new uh, faculty members in basic plant science to seed uh, a group that we call the Center for Plant Biology uh, that runs a graduate program in, in plant science um, education. A major investment in digital agriculture. Much of the digital ag focuses on is what I'm going to be talking to you about today, about uh, phenomics and about uh, enabling um, digitally focused research, both in controlled environments and field environments. And one of the unique aspects of the initiative was around entrepreneurship. And so Purdue has a very strong entrepreneurship group on campus that supports commercial, uh, commercialization of student and faculty IP and supporting startups in the uh, across campus, but especially we actually had money uh, uh, dedicated to supporting egg startups and plant sciences. Uh, I won't, the, the main thing I'm gonna be talking about today is about this uh, focus on plant phenomics research in controlled and field environments. So when we initiated this discussion in 2013 and 2014, the question is, how are we going, where are we going to invest? Um, this is a figure adapted from uh, this paper by Bruce et al in 2002. And it talks in really the focus of this figure is about, if you look, if you look at these uh, environments on the left side, there are, you can do this in agar plates or in growth chambers or greenhouses. You have lots of control over the environment. It's a really great um, type of, environment to look at um, physiology, biochemistry, anatomy, uh, highly reproducible conditions, controlled conditions. How do plants interact with various sorts of environmental cues? Um, and so it's a, it's a great place to do basic science. Uh, however, sometimes it's difficult to translate the results of those research to the field. And so on the other side of the spectrum, we have field trials, multi-environment uh, yield trials, multi-location yield trials, um, rain-fed conditions. And this is the, the, those environments on the right are gonna be those that provide a lot of information about the biology that occurs or the agronomy that occurs that's directly relevant to the producer. And so instead of trying to pick uh, the both sides of the, of the spectrum uh, provide a lot of value to the scientist, uh, but in different ways. And so what we decided to do instead of picking one area or the other, is we decided to selectively um, develop phenomics research platforms that sample these diversity of environments across scales. So today for the first half of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about our, the, the infrastructure that we've developed over the last uh, six or seven years in this space, uh, primarily focusing on our, our uh, field environment, the Indiana Corn and Soybean Innovation Center, and the Ag Alumni Seed Phenotyping Facility in terms of the infrastructure that's been developed to support this research. When we get through that, we'll have a little break and we'll try to answer some questions. Oh, and or, like I said, I'd be happy to answer questions during the presentation as well. And then we're gonna transition. When I first uh, posed this as, an, uh, as, a, as a, an outline for the talk to Dr. Young, I said, oh, we can, we can bring in everybody that's been doing work in phenomics on campus and we'll include a few slides from each. That way there's a, a clear indication of how this research is impacting university students and faculty across the college and across colleges actually at, at Purdue. But it turns out that when I was trying to, we requested the slides, we talked to the PIs in different areas there, we had so much material that I had to do a fair, I had to do some cherry picking in order to tell my story in a straight sort of way. And so instead of presenting all of the types of phenomics oriented research on campus, 
these are specifically more focused on the plant science uh, research projects. And I was cherry picking to try to get some representation of different kinds of projects, uh, both inside and outside uh, with different types of um, scientific questions uh, that were being addressed. So we put this slide together, this figure together a couple of years ago because it really represents the larger, uh, I think a nice summary of, of the types of data that are being collected across scales. This is another way to think about multi-scale phenotyping. And in this case, we're, we're moving from microscopy scale, so cellular scale, subcellular scale phenotyping using microscopy facilities, as well as on the, on the right side of the, of the um, figure, phenomics that is occurring in growth chambers and grease, uh, greenhouses uh, using both um, autonomous or mobile devices as well as handheld devices like the leaf spectrophotometer, for example. And then when you look across the bottom and to the left side, you get more into the field oriented side of the equation where we're talking about autonomous robots moving through the field, satellite acquired data in field environments, UAVs collecting data both in field environments and in natural ecosystems, um, gantry systems in field environments. And so we've got this uh, scale of research. And in the middle, I showed there's a in, a, in a, in a pot here, we have a plant but the real, the real focus of our research, especially um, in the last year or so with Dr. Young and I, we've been focusing on, can we put a plant in the middle and query that plant with all of these scales of phenotyping? And I'll say that it's not as easy as it looks perhaps, but we're starting to make some progress uh, in that direction. And a lot of our focus at the moment is developing the, the database infrastructure that allows us to, to build the, uh, the information that's needed across these scales for a specific set of plants or genotypes or, or conditions that are, that are in question. And I think this would be a good time. This was actually where I was going to introduce Dr. Young. So when we started this research uh, activity or the Institute for Plant Sciences, one of the uh, first uh, things that we wanted to do was recognize that this is a, a full-time job plus for anybody. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to find someone that could help contribute to uh, the, the director for digital phenomics uh, activity. And our first person in this position was April Agee. She was here for a few years and helped us in, in getting, uh, especially the control environment infrastructure up and running. <clears throat> and then she moved on to uh, some new opportunities and, and other horizons. And then we hired Dr. Young. And so April's focus was around biology. She's a biologist at heart, I think would be a fair way to describe her expertise. On the other hand, Dr. Young's expertise is in engineering. He's engineering plant science, but he has a very different perspective on our uh, different skill set than, than April had. And actually we, we benefit from having uh, first the input from April and developing the infrastructure and, and how that might provide insight into plant biology. And then we had uh, Dr. Young come in and help us think about how do we tune these systems and optimize these systems uh, from the standpoint of data capture. So what I'm gonna start off is talking about our controlled environment phenotyping facility. So in the picture here on the left, this is, um, this is a, a new facility on campus, so just a few years old. It's been named the Ag Alumni Seed Phenotyping Facility, the AAPF. It's, uh, it's quite a large facility. In a few minutes, we're gonna be looking inside the growth chamber. So if you can see the doors open to the growth chamber, this is one of the largest growth rooms or growth chambers in North America, a Conviron growth chamber. We can accommodate uh, plants uh, being produced up to 256 plants at a time. One of the distinguishing features about this system is that we're not looking at small plants. We're, this was designed around um, enabling us to grow full grown hybrid maize. And so, we designed the system to phenotype plants up to four meters high. Ideally, we were hoping to be able to phenotype maize plants from, from germination up through physiological maturity and even during the dry down stage. Uh, and so that was really the concept. Um, we're currently, so the current system is fully automated. You can see here in the picture on the left, this is the plants are being moved around the facility on conveyor belts. And so this is a plant to sensor design where the plants are grown in the growth chamber, they're pulled out and then phenotyped on the, on the phenotyping platforms that we'll look at in a minute. 
Uh, but we designed this facility for two chambers and uh, so that if we were able to find some additional funding for another system, we'd be able to install that system so that we would have contrasting environments. And so uh, last year we received funding for the second growth chamber. And so we're gonna more than double uh, our uh, plant production capacity. Again, these are plants up to four meters tall. And in addition to uh, this, the systems that we're gonna talk about here in just a few minutes in terms of the options for growing plants, we also are adding this option to look at modified environmental or atmospheric conditions as well. So we're looking at CO2 injection into both of these chambers so that we can look at changes in, uh, in terms of the gaseous environment as well as um, fully automated control of the water and fertility environment as well. So I, I like to point out that door, uh, the, how bright the chamber is. So in this chamber, we've, uh, we've um, reduced the uh, intensity of the light so you can actually see the plants in there. When you walk into this chamber, it's incredibly bright. Uh, and so this facility is able to accommodate up to 256 plants grown in these, um, in these pots that are um, consistent across the entire system. Each pot is placed in a carrier that has an RFID tag. And so the, the, the system knows uh, every pot, where every pot is in the, in the, in the production facility. And it, the automation allows you to pull plants out uh, upon demand based on which RFID tags uh, you want to look at. So there are essentially three uh, phenotyping stations that have been developed uh, to date for this particular facility. The first is based on an RGB imaging station. And so the RGB Im imaging station allows for side view and top view RGB images of the plants. Uh, so every plant that moves through the system, we can look at up to 120 plants per hour on this automated uh, conveyor system. So about um, two per minute in terms of how quickly we can move them through the RGB imaging station. And we're developing now, we'll talk about that in the second half of the talk, the algorithms that can be used to extract uh, information about the plants um, whether that's information about the, the color or information about the shape, height, size, leaf area, for example, and using those information then to predict back in traits like biomass and leaf, uh, leaf number and leaf characteristics, for example. Uh, in this particular uh, example, we can see uh, you can extract convex hull information. You can do the same with, uh, for example, in wheat or in maize. We have other uh, algorithms that can identify every leaf on the plant. So then you can start calling out phenotypes on a leaf by leaf basis as well. So there's lots of, uh, lots of options for looking at the phenotypes of the plants that are moving through the system. Uh, the RGB information also tells us something about the shape of the plant. And so we want to, since we're, we have top view and side view scanning capacity, we want, the, we want the plant to be oriented inside of the hyperspectral imaging um, booth in the, its widest perspective. So we can see the largest, uh, from a side view, we can see the widest perspective of the plant. So the RGB information tells us the shape of the plant and how the plant should be imaged or should be oriented inside the, the hyperspectral imaging booth. But inside of the hyperspectral imaging booth, we have both Wiener and Swear cameras. And so this gives us roughly 400 to 2,500 nanometers of spectral information, as you can see here on the bottom. And it tells you something about the reflectance characteristics over those wavelengths. Uh, and you can do this on a plant by plant basis. Um, and again, you, there's, you get a, a very different perspective or sense of the characteristics of the plant, whether you're looking at it from the side perspective or you're looking at it from the top perspective. The last sensing booth was added most recently and it's an X-ray CT root scanner. And so the intent of the system was we are developing algorithms that allows a, a models that allow us to predict things like um, plant uh, nutrient content, plant relative plant water content, for example, um, and other attributes of the plant. And the question is, why do we see the variability that we see? In some cases, that's going to be driven by the root phenotype or root phenotypes. And so we installed an X-ray CT root scanner on the system. And so this is looking into the booth. And what I really wanted to be able to show you is um, this is all part of the automation. And so we can scan plants for RGB, we can scan plants for hyperspectral phenotypes or for spectral phenotypes. And those same plants can then be driven through 
the X-ray CT system to look at the 3D root uh, phenotype as well. And so this particular system, we're still learning the ins and outs of how it works and how to optimize the system, how to acquire data. We can grow plants uh, in pots up to 400 millimeters tall. So these are not massive plants, but they provide good information for uh, sort of in that small to medium uh, size plant category. One of the challenges of this particular system is that if you're in a full uh, 400 millimeter pot, it takes nearly 15 minutes to acquire the data. But it does provide excellent uh, spatial resolution uh, and it's certainly adequate for uh, understanding root architecture for crops like corn that have a very coarse uh, root characteristics. And you can see that this is an, an image of a corn root here on the right. So that's our controlled environment facility. And what the intent of our controlled environment facility, if you think back to the, the slide that I showed you a few minutes ago, it's around how do we support basic plant science and our understanding of uh, plant biology is really what it focuses on. And can we make discoveries around our understanding of variation in plant biology, whether that's biochemistry, uh, anatomy, uh, physiology, uh, using these highly reproducible environmental conditions, both above uh, ground shoot characteristics as well as below ground root characteristics. And the intent is, can we then, if we make discoveries in our controlled environment facility, how do we translate those or transition those into the world? And that was, that was the concept around developing the field-based phenotyping facility as well. So this is the Indiana Corn and Soybean Innovation Center. It's a fully integrated field phenotyping facility. It's located at the agronomy farm. So we have over 1600 acres of, of mixed prairie and forest soils represented on the farm. This facility is a little over 25,000 square feet, and it doesn't, it doesn't house everything that we do, but it does serve as the hub for the phenomics research uh, that's done out there. And so, for example, in the high base space on the left, we call that the phenomics tool development space. It's really a, it's a playroom for folks that like to play around with sensors and data and data acquisition, and it's the space where if you walk into the facility in the summertime, it's the space that you'll probably find the engineers or they might be in the next room over, the, the folks that are more interested in data in the uh, data command and control room, where we have, uh, local heart, uh, we have local systems that are able to handle uh, most of the uh, initial data processing um, uh, before it gets pushed back to campus. The rest of the facility is really designed to support all of the other ground referencing data acquisition um, requirements in order to make this a truly functional field phenomics research facility. So the ICSC is about 25,000 square feet. It features state-of-the-art plant and seed processing, threshing and shelling, seed analysis and cold storage. And as I said a few minutes ago, we have the sensor storage room, we have the data command and control room, we have the phenomics tool development laboratory, just as examples of the spaces that we have uh, that are available to support this research. Uh, this picture here that's on the top, it, it's really a, it, hi, it highlights the, the philosophy behind this facility. Everything in this facility is on wheels. There's nothing that's attached to the floor that anybody expects to stay in one place for very long. And the intent, this happens, if you look very carefully, you can see that the people are wearing masks. This was, uh, this was a plant processing uh, work line from 2020. And the plants are coming in at the top of the image and they're are being dissected and being moved down through the through the workflow of the of the people working on the tables and one of the one of the nicest things that uh, about this working in this environment is it's actually uh, environment control it's really pleasant place to work um, sometimes it's hard to get uh, volunteers to help with some of these uh, phen field phenotyping ground referencing data acquisition missions when it's really hot and unpleasant in, in the middle of the summertime, uh, but we can collect uh, plant samples and move them in for processing in the, in the ICSC. One of the, one of the early decisions was that we didn't really want this to be a server space. We didn't want to have to manage this as a server space. So it's actually, uh, it has a dedicated fiber optic connection back to campus. So it currently has a 10 GB connection back to campus and we've got 30 more GB sitting there dark waiting for increased needs uh, from the standpoint of data transfer. And the intent is to use our high performance computing facilities on campus for processing. 
while we do the initial, we will we pull the data down and do some initial look at the data while, at the facility before we push it back to campus. The other, uh, if you look at the bottom here, we have a, a really unique uh, plant th uh, seed processing um, pipeline. Uh, all of the uh, the threshers, whether those are belt threshers or head threshers or or um, ear shellers, everything is fully modular. They can be uh, attached and detached from the system. And they everything again is on wheels. It gets pushed back to the wall if it's not being used. And so you can optimize that uh, in this particular shelling space, there are 10 stations. And if it turns out that you're the only one there and you have 10,000 ears that need to be um, handled in a given day, you can set this up to be optimized in different ways, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. We also have a shared equipment pool that, uh, that equipment can be uh, signed out and there's actually a, a small fee associated with the use. And so we actually have a, um, a pool of funds that can be used to acquire new equipment or to repair equipment when things break down. And that's turned out to be a surprisingly, maybe it shouldn't, maybe it's not surprising, a surprisingly positive uh, opportunity for students to, to use new equipment that they might not uh, normally have access to. We have lots of different types of um, sensor sensors and sensor platforms in the field. We have ground-based systems and airborne systems. We'll actually talk in, in, at length about those in just a few minutes. We're collecting uh, RGB, high resolution RGB and video information, LIDAR data, so 3D point cloud information, hyperspectral data, both Wiener and Swear, as, as well as thermal. One of the big challenges that I've noted is that for many programs, it's hard to get enough expertise. For example, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a plant breeder. It's hard for me to hire enough people and still be able to survive at that burn rate. Um, if I have to have a pilot and I need to have an engineer to, to acquire the and process the data, maybe a, a computer scientist or a statistician to, to do the, uh, the model development, as well as the agronomists and the, and the field biologists that are needed to grow the crop. And so one of the, one of the things that we've been very deliberate about doing, and this is something that, that Young coordinates, is our plant phenotyping service. And so you can uh, communicate with uh, the Institute for Plant Sciences, make a request, for example, for the drone, I wanna acquire these data in this field on these dates. Uh, and they, they will collect the data and make that data accessible to you uh, through this service. Um, I think that would be a good spot to stop. We're about 30 minutes in. I was hoping that I'd be able to finish this at 30 minutes. If there's any, any questions, and I can either, I don't know if it makes sense to stop sharing for a minute. Maybe, maybe it'll make sense. If anybody has any questions now, I can see them in the chat if anybody wants to throw any questions about the facilities that we've developed. I'm gonna go back in in the second half. I'm gonna talk about what are those platforms like? Where did they come from? Who's developing the, uh, the pipelines for processing data? Um, who's working in different crops, uh, uh, et cetera, in the second half of the talk. But if there's any questions about uh, the platforms, we can talk about that now. Thanks, thanks, Mitch. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, I, I have a question. Um, so are these facilities available to external users or is it uh, limited to Purdue researchers, students? Jan, what's the answer to that question? Since he gets that question all the time. Is he still on? I don't see his telephone there anymore. Yeah, no. yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. So is the, are these facilities available to external users? Uh, we are trying to, do, to make it available to both internal and external users, but we also uh, want to mention that we, we would like to encourage our external users to please establish a collaboration with our faculties on, on campus. That could be you know, a better, if you may, win-win situations for both our researchers on campus as well as our collaboration, uh, collaborations. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has interest, they should contact you, Yang. Uh, I'm more than happy to be the one, yeah, to provide you more information. Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, so we actually, just a, a little extension of that, we actually collaborate both with uh, folks at other universities to acquire data on joint projects. 
and we collaborate with private sector partners as well that are interested in whatever i mean these represent lots of different areas of expertise and they have different um uh, needs or things that they're interested in acquiring sometimes it's data sometimes it's when i say data sometimes it's just the raw data that they want to look at so that they can develop uh, analytics tools and other times it's biology and genetics and things like that yeah so there's a follow-up from roberto tuberosa um yeah actually that he would be interested or that would be an interest interest maybe from the eu eu side also to collaborate so if we, we've addressed that so we're a member of the IPPN as well. So yeah, actually, I think there's a lot, there'll be lots of opportunities as, um, as new capacity continues to come online, new funding continues to come online. Uh, and for some of these, uh, and I'll actually talk about it at the end of the, the second half of the presentation about some of our efforts in pushing into international environments for some of these activities as well. Mm -hmm. So in the, uh, in the controlled environment facility, are you able to, um run multiple projects at the same time or, or is it one project at a time basically so as long as the environmental conditions are the same so as long as you're not uh, if you're not if you're not trying to vernalize winter wheat at the same time as you're growing uh, corn treatments for summer production you can put them on um, they can be combined together and so i think the minimum uh, the normal minimum request is for a conveyor belt and so that would be um it's either 28 or 32 plants on a belt and so you you, you uh, sort of rent these or you access these uh, by belt and so you get them in sets of either 28 or 32 i forget the number 32 32 32 yep okay so there's another question in the chat from kishav singh um what differences or advances you got imaged versus lidar based point clouds and plant phenotyping. Some terms in there that I don't understand. So you may have to explain a little bit if you understand what the question is. Jan, do you want to start with that? Uh, that's a loaded question, but there's a good one. Uh, actually, um, well, funny you should ask the question. I really appreciate it. Actually, we, we have been trying to establish data pipelines for both the uh, uh, RGB-based um, uh, data point for height uh, measurement as well as LIDAR. Uh, so far, we like what we see in LIDAR um, uh, data cloud uh, height uh, based uh, height measurements in the sense of in terms of the measurement wise, it's, uh, especially when the, the plants are more homogeneous, uh, the, our, our algorithm seems to have an easier time when we go with LIDAR rather than go with uh, RGB. Uh, that being said though, uh, of expertise actually in remote sensing, especially in the uh, GIS side. Uh, they did provide us also solutions in uh, handling the homogeneous um, targets when we use RGB uh, 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 sensor for the remote sensing. Mm -hmm. So if you have more interest, please keep, keep tuned. We have a manuscript actually coming up soon. Okay, thank you. And, and Mitch, you're going to talk a little bit more about the data processing, I think. Yes, next the second half. Yeah, um, there, are, there are advantages to structure for motion RGB versus uh, 3D and some of its cost and differences in processing. Uh, so some of the field-based software now uh, enable structure for motion-based 3D reconstructions uh, using relatively low-cost uh, RGB platforms. Um, a lot of our 3D reconstruction at the moment is LiDAR-based, although we, uh, one of the other researchers here at Purdue, Dr. Katie Martin-Rainey, I think her system just came out with structure for motion RGB based um, analyses, but I haven't, I think that was in February. I haven't had a chance to, to work with any of those platform, uh, the software tools yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, question from yeah, Monica we, we, Herrero. We're using ICSC. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I say that again. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat that? No, no, I, I, what I meant is that uh, we have been trying to leverage multiple uh, software package uh, at ICSC actually. Okay. The Phoenix has been leveraged in terms of the height measurement. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, question from Monica Herrero. How are you planning to extend the phenotyping to other crops in addition to soybean and corn? 
Uh, so in the control facility at one time, we've had as many as seven different species growing in there as variable as um, garlic, basil, um, kale. kale, sorghum, corn, soybeans, rice, canola. Um, and so, yes, we are looking at lots of different crops. Um, it, part of this focus on corn is because that's my background. And so that's where I, a lot of times that's what I'm playing with or starting with. Uh, but the platforms are, themselves are crop agnostic, both inside and outside. Okay, so those are all the questions we have in the chat. So maybe, Mitch, if you want to share again and continue the presentation. And yeah, those of you online uh, would keep putting questions in the chat and we'll... Uh, so the second half of my talk uh, jogs your thoughts about something that happened in the first half. Just hold on to that question until the end of the second half and we can jump all the way to the beginning of the talk as necessary. So I call this case studies, but I, I ended up shortening it to the point of just um, maybe we call them vignettes. Um, all, again, what I was trying to do is we have, uh, we've been working hard to develop this infrastructure uh, in phenomics, both controlled and field environments. And we've been uh, reaching out to faculty across campus to look for opportunities of um, leveraging this capacity to advance science and our understanding of, uh, of plant biology. And in fact, in the, at one point in the second half, we'll talk a little bit about sheep as well. And this is, uh, this is uh, like I said, a lot, there aren't a lot of plant biologists running around that, that um, grew up in the, the age of phenomics. And so a lot of our activities, so Yang and I do a lot of tag teaming across the College of Agriculture, sharing what's possible, uh, encouraging uh, uh, studies uh, from faculty in different areas so that we can start branching out into, into new areas of biology. And I also spend a lot of time, I, I call it across the street. And so State Street runs through the middle of campus the ag folks are on the south side of State Street in general. And I do a lot of work with the folks on the north side of the street in the College of Science and College of Engineering, exploring new sensing modalities, or chatting with faculty that have expertise in new sensing modalities and opportunities to collaborate and develop capacity and research. So I, I wanted to start off by saying that the controlled environment facility is amazing. You walk into the facility, it's a, uh, I get the same response every time we run a tour, which is, wow, this is a lot of equipment and a lot of, um, uh, this is a sophisticated system. And so Dr. Young, maybe when we get to the end of the next set, it was actually seven different vendors that were brought in that this is not a, this isn't a Lemnitech system. It's not a CAN system or a, you know, an end-to-end -end system. This was a system essentially designed around the concept of um, commercial automated horticulture. Let's use those systems to do phenomics and develop a, a platform using the automation uh, that's possible in horticulture today in horticulture production facilities, for example. And so a lot of this required a fair bit of prototyping and thinking what's gonna work and what works better with one system versus another system. And so many of the major components of our larger AAPF facility were prototyped in, a, in, in greenhouse based uh, systems. And so this is a small greenhouse prototyping research platform that we developed with Dr. Jian Jin. You can see his picture up there on the right. Jian is in the Ag and Biological Engineering Department he actually comes to Purdue from uh, Corteva. It was, I don't know which the company's name was when he came, but I, it may have been, I think he came to us when he was still DuPont, um, but he came from Johnston and his expertise was in the area of controlled environment phenotyping. And so we've been working together with, with Dr. Jin in prototyping capacities in this small greenhouse platform where we're not interrupting, you know, big experiments. We can just we can, I call it playing, but we can play on the system and try to figure out uh, how, do, how, how does a system like this work and what are its pros and cons and what would we do if we wanted to go big? And so Dr. Jin has been a wonderful collaborator in this space. And so we actually have been working on two different kinds of arrangements. On the left here, 
I'm going to start this video again here. Uh, on the left here, we have a plant to sensor conveyor system. And then this particular system, it's just a small imaging box. We can't grow 14 meter tall corn plants. We can grow plants up to about three quarters of a meter to a meter tall. But it's a plant to sensor system. The sensor sits still, uh, the plants are moved to the sensor. And how does a system of this type, which is, this is actually how the system in the AAPF is designed. How does it compare to this system here on the right where we have another greenhouse where we've constructed a gantry and we have on the gantry, we have a shuttle that moves the sensors to the plants. And um, there are, you know, there's different value in these different systems and they tell you different kinds of things. And so we've been working with Dr. Jim's group to do prototyping and he's been very gracious to help us think about how do we, how do you go big? And, that, and that's uh, one, of the, one of the great chances or opportunities that we have in working with our engineering colleagues across campus. Um, I enjoy challenging our, my, my engineering colleagues with, with either problems or give us, a big, give us some big vision about something, some big machine that we could build. And they're usually uh, really quick to, to respond to that sort of a challenge. A lot of the work that we did in this prototyping has been published. And as I was sitting here thinking about what, you know, are there some, some bigger pieces of this that maybe I'd want to share with a group? I, I tried to pull three papers for a few different areas that are a little more developed. This first paper here is in um, uh, Computers and Electronics and Agriculture. It actually, it's a paper that describes a method for environment modeling. And so we went into the, the, the student, Dong Dong Ma, the PhD student on this paper, the first author, and he actually simulated this greenhouse environment uh, with all of the factors that are contributing to microclimates or to heterogeneity in the environment. And uh, he, he, he developed a really clever model for doing that. And then he applied this model, which is his first paper, to how could you correct for this heterogeneity, knowing what the predicted heterogeneity is, can we use this conveyor system to move plants around in the facility to remove these microclimate effects? We actually did the experiment and looked at what happened to the variability, uh, the plant to plant variability in, a, in an optimized um, system of this type where we're moving plants around to mix, to mix up the microenvironments that plants are exposed to. Uh, and this is the this is the follow up paper to the first. Both of these were published in 2019. And then recently, uh, one of the last talks, so one of the last little vignettes I'm going to share is around a handheld sensor that he called that's called the leaf spec. Again, this is Dr. Jin's idea around. You look at some of these facilities and you say, wow, there's no way we could ever do that because of whatever the constraint happens to me. It's usually money. And what his concept was is. These, the, the big sensors and big dollars have their place in terms of phenomics, but he's actually developed a leaf spec, which is a handheld system. And I'm gonna come back to that in about 40 minutes or so before the, the end of the hour, maybe 30 minutes from now, and talk about what the value proposition for having a handheld system uh, for collecting these kinds of data, especially as it relates to the value proposition for, for a group of plant scientists. The field platforms were levered, they largely, they really leveraged a project uh, supported by the DOE RPE program in transportation energy resources from renewable agriculture, the Terra program. So Purdue's had two rounds of Terra funding and Purdue's Terra project was really focused on developing ground-based and UAV-based uh, phenomics or phenotyping platforms. And so I've, it's a big, these are big projects. And so at Purdue, we had a couple of plant scientists, myself and Cliff Weil, and we were interacting with Ayman Habib and Melba Crawford in civil engineering, Ed Delp and ECE in electrical and computer engineering, Keith Cherkauer in ag and biological engineering, and David Ebert in, in electrical and computer engineering. And so the Purdue team was charged with developing these platforms. And we were collaborating with the University of Queensland because one way of thinking about the data is how do you, how do you, do, how do you transfer your understanding of phenomics in one environment to other environments when you've got differences in weather and soils and other factors? And the way we're doing that is we're trying to implement um, much of the prediction inside of our, we're exploring the, the predictions inside of a, 
biophysical crop models. And, and it turns out that Graham Hammer is the father of APSIM, which this is a sorghum project. And APSIM was really designed around modeling and, and prediction of phenotypes in sorghum. And so we're trying to merge the two from a, from a phenomics perspective. This, these are the players on, on our second project. And so the rest of the people on the list here are people that we're collaborating with because we're charged with how do you take these systems that are, we're showing here on the right and move those out into the commercial landscape. And so Griffin is holding the IP, Edwall Photonics is one of our major um, sensor suppliers. And then we're collaborating with Corteva, Bex and Ag Alumni to look for opportunities. What are, what are, what's the value proposition inside of companies that have slightly different focus of or size of their operation? So just a couple of really quick highlights. This is what we call the Fina Rover. It's a modified crop sprayer. Um, where this is actually even one iteration too old. If you look across the top of the boom, you can see we have 11 different mounts for sensors. And these sensors are essentially um, uh, near proximal. So we're in very close proximity to the canopy when we're, when we're operating in the ground space. And they provide extremely high resolution uh, data acquisitions, uh, millimeter scale resolution. We've gone through a whole series of iterations of airborne platforms. We started out largely with fixed wing platforms and we saw how expensive the sensors were. We didn't want to have a, we didn't want to have a rotary wing, wing, uh, wing aircraft crash and, and smash a $100,000 hyperspectral sensor. But as our confidence in these systems grew, we're actually largely flying these rotary wings platforms today. Uh, our workhorse platform at the moment, that is sort of uh, the default system that we fly is RGB, high resolution RGB LIDAR for point cloud generation in hyperspectral in the Wiener. And we've developed uh, uh, processing pipelines that allow us to co-register all of these data sets. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Again, I was thinking a lot of this is work has been published and I was thinking of some um, key papers that the, the group might be interested in, in reading or think, uh, looking at. Dr. Habib is a, he's a world renowned expert in geomatics. And so he's the one that's really been helping us with our, with our registration of our data sets so that we can compare data across different modes and scales. And uh, his group recently published a paper on new orthophoto generation strategies from the UAV and ground remote sensing platforms. That it, it's really good. Um, if this is of interest to you, Ali Muschetti is a works in Dr. Crawford's laboratory. Dr. Crawford's area of expertise is in analysis uh, analytics or analysis of hyperspectral data, especially. Uh, but she has expertise in a number of these modes. And he published a really nice paper on multi-temporal predictive modeling of sorghum biomass uh, using, this is UAV based, using convolutional neural networks and other kinds of machine learning approaches to incorporate multi-temporal data. And then this last paper uh, that was in 2020, this last paper here is actually the first of a series of papers we're gonna be publishing on trying to uh, merge these biophysical crop uh, growth models, APSIM, with uh, remotely sensed data. And the focus really is around how do you start parameterizing these, these crop growth models using remotely sensed data versus relying entirely on um, manual data collection. So those two projects really, they're not, that's not the only data that it's, it's not the only information that's informing how we're doing this. We have other researchers across campus that are clearly experts in remote sensing and, and data acquisition and processing, but those are, those played an important role. And I just wanted to highlight those, especially the, the, the people that were critical to getting those running with Dr. Jin and the control environment, as well as the researchers I just talked about, our, our, our group of engineering faculty on the, on the Terra project. One of the next little stories that I wanted to talk about is again, it's another collaboration with Dr. Jin. Dr. Jin finds his way to the agronomy farm. And so now we're collaborating at the farm with a phenotyping gantry. This is not some of you that might be familiar, for example, with the gantry at Maricopa, which is uh, you know, one of the largest machines for phenotyping in the world. It has its place. That's not what this is. This is a, this is a extremely high temporal resolution um, platform. It's really designed around the temporal piece. And if you look at this figure over here on the right, we have a rail with a shuttle on the top with an arm with a hyperspectral sensor. And what that allows us to do, given the orientation, is that we have 
uh, shadowless operation. The shadow, we don't shadow these plants ever, but we can use this platform to acquire data um, in this experiment. And so what that allows us to do then, in fact, I'm going to go to the, I, we have a little video on the next, on the next slide. I think it'll show up, it'll be more clear. So if you look up at the top image, I hope you can see that the, the shuttle on the rail is operating, is moving up and down over the, over the corn that's growing in the fields. And what, we're, uh, what this allows us to do is to acquire information about every six to 10 minutes. It's not running the whole length of the rail because it, I think it's, a, it's 30 minutes up and back. And, and we thought that maybe that was too much time. We needed to see the plants more often than that. So we shortened the run, the length of the run to improve or to increase the temporal data uh, acquisition. And what that allowed us to do is we actually collected data continuously uh, during daylight hours from sunup to sunset for about 35 days. And we collected, um, we imaged corn plants. And so this is, the, this is actually the, the image here of the data that's being acquired up above. And these are pairs of two row plots. And so we have two corn hybrids, a modern and an older corn hybrid with three nitrogen treatments. And we have uh, nearly continuous data acquisition for 30 some days over this, over this experiment. At the same time, we were collecting environmental uh, weather data with a weather station located at the same position. And we have uh, soil sensors so we can get a sense of what's happening underground. But what I wanted to point to is this, this figure here in the bottom left. You can see the dates where we were acquiring the data. Each one of these blobs is actually the data collected for a day. And in this case, we're presenting or we're projecting NDVI, so a, just a small fraction of the hyperspectral data. And then what you do is you, if you zoom in on, for example, this fourth day of acquisition and look at it, you, uh, and you spread it out on the x-axis, what you see is the dark green is the high nitrogen treatment, the lime green is the medium, and the red is the low nitrogen. And you can see that we have different hyperspectral responses across those three nitrogen treatments, no surprise. That's, uh, that's reasonably well known. But if you look at the time here on the x-axis, what you see is you get this V-shaped pattern to the data acquisition. So these are data acquired uh, on the same sets of plants all day long. And what you'll see is what's changing between uh, say 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And then the end of the afternoon at five or six o'clock that's causing this V-shaped pattern on these same plants. We know that the environmental conditions are changing. That's why we had the weather station there. And if you look up at the sky, you can see that the clouds are moving across. The, the, the cloudscape changes from day to day. But regardless of the day, we see the same V-shaped pattern. And so what are the other factors that are driving this variability in, in, in remote sensing data, in the acquisition of that data? And some of this is being driven by the environmental factors. And some of this is being driven by the plants growing in, those, in this landscape and their changes circadian rhythm throughout the day. And it's also being impacted by the changing angle of the sun over the course of the day. And so the beautiful part of this system, it's a very simple system, a very simple concept, but by having all of this data collected over 30 days under varying environmental conditions, varying within days and over days, and having continuous data over the course of the experiment, what we're now doing is we're using this data to model what is, can we model, I should say, the variability that's represented here? Because if you're gonna go out, this would be the, the reason for this whole experiment actually, is if I'm going to the genomes to field study, I think it's one of the next experiments I'm gonna talk about, and I collect data early in the morning or in the middle of the afternoon at, at the height of the, at the, when the sun is at its zenith or later in the afternoon, I could have variable NDVI measurements that are not related, or that are related more to the time of the variability is related more to the time of data, day that the, the data is collected versus other factors. And so we wanna to try to understand what's causing this variability. And so this, is, this has been a really nice experiment. We're in the final stages of putting the, uh, together a paper that models, uh, that attempts to model some of this, these factors so that we can take that out of, take that variability out of the acquisition data. So, so Mitch, a, a question here on uh, from the chat um, that I'd like to insert, in, in, insert here from Sinjua Sankaran. And he asks, uh, does the wind 
cause issues associated with image quality. Yes. Yep, the wind, all of these factors. So we, we know wind speed, we know wind direction, we know temperature, we know how much, uh, how, how much light is coming down at any one point using uh, upwelling uh, sensors. And we're using all of those as factors to better understand what's causing, in this case, NDVI, but it could be, like I said, NDVI is a relatively simple measurement. It gives a, a, a relatively stable, well, reasonably well understood uh, index value. And so, for example, what's happening here? Why are all of the, why do we see all of this scatter? Um, it looks like it's due to probably dew, and as the plants dry down, that tends to go away. So, if you weren't aware of how important this this early morning scatter was, you might be out at uh, eleven o'clock or ten o'clock because you, you know the weather said that it was supposed to be nice this morning, but the clouds were going to come up this afternoon. So you run to the field and quickly collect your data, and eleven seems like a good time to do it, or maybe ten even though that we know that there's a lot of variability associated with um, these other environmental factors or temporal factors. Okay, thanks. So this high temporal resolution phenotyping gantry is really providing some unique insights into the factors that impact remote sensing data. And uh, we're putting together a paper that describes that now, uh, Dong Dong Ma, the, the PhD student now postdoc working in Dr. Jin's lab. Um, and some of the preliminary modeling studies suggest we may be able to correct for some of these effects if we, if we understand them. The next experiment I know is one that some of the people on the call and a lot of people in the country are familiar with the genomes to fields corn study. And so this is actually an experiment or one of several experiments that we're trying to link our controlled environment data with our field environment data. And so this is the field uh, environment platform. Uh, and what we're gonna be talking about is work that Monica uh, working with Dr. Young um, in the Institute for Plant Sciences. Monica is a postdoc in the, in the Institute and Seth Tali is a PhD student with me. And so the four of us uh, represent very different perspectives on what this data uh, represent. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a little bit about what we're learning about these platforms and acquisition of, of data in the genomes to field study. So last year uh, we, we were transitioning our UAV platform and we were using a platform, this is an M600 that has a high resolution RGB, a Microsense Red Edge camera and a LiDAR unit. And we're using those sensors then to, to learn about uh, variability in stand count, plant height, flowering time, uh, RGB, just looking at the data, the visual inspection of what the plants look like. The, the Microsense camera tells you something about uh, vegetative indices and relatively well understood indices that reflect uh, changes in physiology and the LIDAR is providing 3D structure. So this field that's highlighted in the blue box here is actually the, the genomes to fields experiment. I think there were 500-ish entries in that study last year. We flew the experiment 19 times between late May and late September. And part of the other, part of the other value or part of the objective really, one of the really important objectives of this was to compare the different types of software that are available to process these data. And so we were actually using Phoenix, which is the, the data out of Dr. Katie Mar or is sorry, it's a software program out of um, Progeny, Dr. Katie Martin Rainey's uh, company. Pix4D is a commercial software program and Griffin is the company that's commercializing the Terra, uh, so the Terra processing software. So we had, three different software environments for processing the data. And then we went into this experiment and many other experiments and collected information like stand count, plant and ear height, plant height over time, and thesis and silking dates, grain yields, et cetera. The standard uh, sets of traits that we measure in the genomes of fields experiment. Using the RGB software with Phoenix, this, uh, the program uh, that's provided through Progeny, you could go in and you could estimate uh, due to the stand counts over these, uh, you could overlay the shape file and extract stand count information from all of the plots in the field. Um, the RGB or the LIDAR data was processed using the Griffin software. The Griffin software is designed to process the, um, these particular data sets. For those that are familiar with the genomes to fields experiment, this area in green here, these are the inbreds in the high intensity Phenotyping study, we're in the next block over, which is the standard genomes to field study. 
So for those that aren't that familiar with looking at the looking at LIDAR data, this is LIDAR data. This is a heat map showing the point clouds colorized by their height um, in the in the 3D in the 3D uh, the DTM in this case. And so we, we can see that the genomes, the fields experiment, these were two row plots. And so we've got, these are two rows. They're colorized by height and they're a little bit taller than the rest of the plots in the field. Blue represents ground height. Green is somewhat shorter than, than the red. If you zoom in on plots, you can look at these in two perspectives. You can look at them from the top view and you can see, for example, these, these two two row plots are a little bit taller than these two two row plots. Um, and if you can also flip them up on edge and look at them from the side, and from the side view, this is what these two row plots on the right look like from below, and that's what these two row plots on the left look like. And this is in this experiment, part of the experiment adjacent to the um, another experiment where we have inbreds in the in the trial, and you can see the differences between inbred performance and hybrid performance. We've started modeling the LIDAR using the LIDAR data to estimate. You can actually use it directly to, uh, to estimate plant height. And the way you do that is using the height histograms of the 3D point cloud data. And if you look at the reference data, this was measured on three individual plants using a, a height stick the old fashioned way versus the LIDAR estimated uh, point cloud estimate. In this case, we were using the 99th percentile of the, the height of the 99th percentile point in the LIDAR point cloud. We can, you can see we have a very nice one-to-one -one, um, relationship, but they're not right on the one-to-one -one line. And it turns out that the reference data are always a little bit higher than the other data. And uh, this reflects the difference between having a tassel that's sticking out of the canopy versus in, 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 in whether you have a, a top leaf collar measurement versus a, versus a uh, top of the, the tassel measurement and what you're exactly measuring using the LIDAR point cloud data, which is um, irrespective of tassels, it is where are the points in the 3D point cloud and how do those compare with, uh, in terms of the percentile, uh, the measurement from the ground. But you can see that you have a very nice one-to-one -one relationship shown here. You can also collect these data throughout the growing season. And so we were looking at plant height throughout the growing season. Here we have four plots. You can see that this uh, light blue uh, maize colored and dark blue plots uh, flowered at a, it looks like they flowered at approximately the same time and they have different heights and they had different heights throughout the growing season consistently different and that this green bar represents a genotype that flowered later it achieved maximum height later than these other three and you can compare differences in plant height throughout the growing season at all of these time points measured using the, the LIDAR. Uh, at the at the uh, at the NAPPN meeting last month, we heard a lot of presentations about how do you start thinking about using these data, using just the height data from these 19 acquisitions. You can even start thinking with no other information about modeling things like yield. And we know that yield and plant height are related already, especially if I should uh, on the previous slide, the relationship between plant height and uh, maturity and the types of materials that were in the right. genomes to field study. And you could actually see that you can model uh, grain yield just, just using the plant height information uh, over time. And you can imagine what happens when you start adding genetic information and other kinds of information. This doesn't use any of the spectral information. It doesn't use any of the, the StanCon information, for example, or canopy cover information. You start loading these data sets together, or these different modes of data together, and you, uh, you very quickly get a very data intensive, uh, you can support data intensive models from machine learning perspective. So to just quickly summarize that, um, these UAV platforms are, have a number of advantages, uh, really high spatial resolution, less than one centimeter. I think these are at seven millimeter resolution in terms of the RGB. You can have it as high a temporal resolution as you can afford in terms of flying weekly or even subweekly if you wanted or, or less often. And one of the things that's special about this particular system is that with the, with the onboard GN SS INS, uh, the, the chip, it provides some really high resolution and co-registered data sets. We have multiple data processing lines using this system, and we're now exploring opportunities to use either existing analytical pipelines or to develop new analytical pipelines to start looking at some of these agronomic traits. 
Okay, Jack, we're getting close. The ruminants. I, I barely knew how to spell that when I was putting the slide together. I got, I got the dictionary out to find what is a ruminant? Is that like a monocot? No, it's not. The ruminants that we're looking at are sheep. This is an experiment that Shelby Gruss up there in the top right is handling for her PhD. And so uh, Shelby Gruss is the PhD student. Keith Johnson is the, the, the forge specialist in extension here at Purdue in agronomy and myself. And if you look at this picture, what you see is a whole series of forage sorghum hybrids. And a few years ago, we began a project where we disrupted or we knocked out the, the biosynthetic pathway for durin production in sorghum. Durin is a cyanogenic glucoside and the crop has to be managed so that it doesn't have high concentrations of durin that can cause toxicity and poisoning and even death in animals if they're allowed to either graze or consume this, uh, consume a product that hasn't been managed properly. And so one of the experiments that I thought would be really easy to do was, let's take an experimental hybrid that's durin free, no durin, completely uh, um, knocked out versus three conventional sorghum hybrids. And we know that durin accumulates to very high concentrations in young plants, so it wouldn't really be fair to feed these, to, to graze these animals uh, early in development. So let's graze them under relatively normal conditions when they're at a, an acceptable height. In this case, I think we were looking at 30 inches was the, the minimum height. And so this, this is actually the experiment where we have three conventional hybrids that are durin producers versus one that's knocked out. And what we did is we did a whole series of grazing studies starting in 2019. And so these were three day grazing experiments with sheep in replicated plots. And so inside the white box, we have rep one and rep two. The red box shows where the experimental, the durin free entry was at and the lime green, the blue and the purple or the, the light blue and the purple were the conventional hybrids, green treat rocket, sweet six and sweet bites. And we turned the sheep uh, and you can see that there's some, well, let me explain a little bit more. We, on day zero, we sampled the plots for biomass. So we knew how much biomass was there before the sheep were allowed to feed. And at the end of the experiment, we sampled again to find out how much was taken away. And then we ran the sheep into the experiment. Oh, and then we flew the drone before the sheep were in first. I'm sorry about that. And then we acquired uh, UAV data on day zero, one, and two, uh, allowing the sheep to graze freely. And what we see here is this is a, this is a threshold, NDVI thresholded image at 0.4. And this white color is actually the, represented the representing the green foliage of the, of the plots. And if you look carefully at red box here, so this is, I'm gonna, this is the punchline. This is the durin free entry on day zero before the sheep are in. This is the durin free entry on day one after they've been feeding for a day. And this is the durin free entry on day two after they've been feeding for two days. You look at the second rep and you see the same pattern. In fact, on the second rep, there was virtually nothing left in the durin free entry, even though there shouldn't have been a lot of durin there to begin with. Uh, it appears that there was something about that hybrid that the sheep were able to, take, to taste or to sense, or maybe they're sensing a cyanide release because of the cyanide is released really quickly. But this is just a, the point that the reason I put this in here is it really highlights the power of, of these remote systems for acquiring extremely quantitative data around, in this case, sheep feeding. And we can plot this, we can plot these data over time. And there's ma massive differences among entries for the disappearance of, of, of foliage estimated using these NDVI estimates or these NDVI measurements. If you look at this, we also had trail cameras in the field and so you can process this in, in RGB as well. What does it look like on time zero? This, this plot with a flag in it is the durin free one. And you can see the sheep uh, graze freely throughout the trial. And that by the end of the second day, they pretty well not only eat it eaten the leaves, but they've also eaten the stems right back to the ground um, and appear to show a lot of preference for this particular genotype versus uh, the other conventionals that were represented. So just an example, sheep prefer to graze on these durin-free sorghum sedan hybrids. We're not even sure why yet. Um, and the, as it relates to this presentation, this UAV phenotyping platforms provides very strong and quantitative estimates of biomass removal that support more subjective visual estimates of, of feeding preference. And it also completely supports, we measured biomass before and after, and you can see that they're, they're completely aligned in terms of uh, biomass disappearance. 
And the beauty is, is that you can take this data every day. You don't have to go in and destructively sample on a daily basis to get that, this kind of data. Another group on campus that's really ramping up work in this space is in the forestry department, uh, forestry and natural resources department. This is Professor Song Lin uh, Fei, and he's uh, he was just named the Dean's Chair for Remote Sensing, and he was also the award winner for the 2020 Ag Research Award. His research is all about digitizing or to espousing the value proposition of digital forestry. How do we digitize um, forestry so that we can actually do a better job of understanding uh, forest health, as well as understanding what kinds of trees are present and what's the status of those trees, and potentially even predicting what would be the how much money, how much what might be the return on investment of logging a particular uh, forest in year one versus two versus three, for example. One of his close colleagues in that department is John Couture. He's uh, he was one of the faculty that was hired. Uh, in this basic plant science hire uh, in the Center for Plant Biology. John, in this case, is interested in chestnut blight in, 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 um, in, in, at the forestry uh, uh, field site. And so chestnut blight pretty well wiped out chestnuts in, in the Americas because they were highly sensitive to this particular blight. Um, and we have plantings now. There have been a lot of work over the last 50 years to incorporate genetic resistance into the American chestnut so that we can see a potentially a recovery of this species. And so you can see on the left, these are plantings of these um, reported to be genetically resistant uh, chestnut trees. And what John's been doing is he's been going through these plantings. They're not all equally resistant. Some of them uh, break down over time. And so he's actually able to rate these trees for their relative variability in, in sensitivity to, to chestnut blight. And they've been collecting data using the using more or less the same platform. It wasn't the exact same platform, but it was a, a very, very similar M600 with a similar sort of sensor package. Uh, in that case, I think in the, the case that they were looking at, they included the SWEAR camera on the, for the hyperspectral detection. And they're developing, uh, they can use this data now to develop predictions for uh, chestnut, blight, chestnut blight severity in different trees that are represented in these, in these plantings. And they're, they're able to do that because they can see that the, the, the plants or the, the trees that are more susceptible have a different reflectance profile than the trees that are resistant. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of southern, southern Indiana is in hardwood forest. And so there's a lot of excitement about using remote sensing about pushing digital forestry as an opportunity to identify and quantify forest health as well as to inventory the species that are present. And depending, uh, you probably wouldn't do this with uh, hyperspectral imaging, but maybe with LIDAR imaging, uh, use that to inventory the quality of the trees that are present uh, in those particular forests, especially as it relates to actually predicting um, the value of the trees that are present. Dr. Mohsen Mohammadi is uh, our wheat breeder. He's been doing work with uh, using the RGB platform and the controlled environment to quantify variation and in uh, plant growth or in plant biomass. And so he's uh, been doing work looking at plants that are exposed uh, 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 drought tolerant and sensitive genotypes that are exposed to water stress and looking at and predicting variation in plant biomass over time. And he's found that he's, uh, he's developed uh, the relative growth rate of biomass uh, predicted using these RGB images that do a very nice job of predicting variation in response uh, to these types of, of, of drought treatments. And so the, in his case, the side projected area was a very efficient predictor of biomass up until heading. And at that point, it wasn't quite as good as it was before. And he's now using that to quantify variability because it can be measured non-destructively, measure variability in biomass over time as an estimate of looking at plant responses to stresses. We have a lot of folks in plant pathology working on the use or using remote sensing or using high throughput phenomics uh, platform similar to what we've talked about today to quantify variability in plant disease. In some cases, it seems relatively straightforward. You've got big blotches on the leaves. Are they there or are they not? The reason I, I picked Anjali's experiment to, to highlight here today is because it's a complicated phenotype. So she's looking at Ralstonia solanaceum. Uh, and this is a root pathogen that causes wilting. 
And so when you look at differences in resistance, the differences in resistance are expressed in terms of what the shoots look like based on a wilting phenotype. And so she worked with, I should back this up, her group worked with uh, Professor Delp uh, in um, ECE, Electrical and uh, Computer Engineering, and his two students to develop algorithm, algorithms that could detect differences or that could predict differences in the wilting phenotypes of tomato as a proxy for differences in, in, in resistance to Rolstonia. And so they developed an image processing pipeline. They actually developed a dedicated station where they could image these plants, they could do color correction, and then they could actually estimate variability in wilting using this platform. Uh, those results are described in this paper by Young, Young et al. 2020. They then used this pipeline to screen plant, uh, populations of tomato plants for variability in wilting in response to Ralstonia. They did some expert validation of these data for with the human eye to make sure that it, it looked right, but they were able to combine that with the genetic information of, uh, of the population, and they were able, actually able to identify genes that were driving variability in, in response uh, to Ralstonia infection. In fact, now that information is being used, now that we have the, now that we know what the variability and resistance is, it's being used in the X-ray CT data sets to see what's the below ground phenotype that's, that, what are the phen below ground phenotypes that correspond to this wilting or non-wilting phenotype. Uh, and that's work that's ongoing in the lab right now. A lot of work is, is going on looking at uh, uh, root phenotypes using X-ray CT. Again, this is the system that we talked about before. It's integrated into our automated controlled environment facility. Plants are called out of the growth chamber. They're moved into the imaging booth where we have an X-ray source. The samples uh, are on the belt and then the detectors on the backside. Uh, we've developed this automatic pipeline using, this happens to be a Fraunhofer uh, system. And so we're able to leverage the, the software provided by the vendor. And we were really targeting, can we use these systems to differentiate uh, differences in corn? And so this is variability in corn rooting over time. As you see, the, 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 the corn root architecture changes or it develops over time, uh, reflecting differences in growth rate. That brings a point to something that Monica is doing actually, where she's actually developing new methods to look at can you measure differences in growth rate from the point at which a stress might occur? And so she's uh, to, uh, to, uh, through, uh, comparing two different points in time, really. And so she's actually been doing a really nice job of taking this, uh, this data processing um, pipeline and uh, allowing us to look at the, the 4D effect, which is changes in plant growth rate over time. And so she's actually working on a, a nice paper that describes how you can use this, these multi-time data sets to look at changes in plant root growth uh, over different biological periods when the roots might be exposed to, for example, you might impose a salinity stress and then ask questions about what happened to the roots, or you might expose them to Ralstonia if it's tomato, or you might expose them to drought and look at variability in, in, in uh, growth rates of roots over, over over times at which they're exposed to these stress treatments. And these are being implemented on, on multiple plant species, uh, and particularly in corn and tomato. The last point I wanted to, to make was getting back to, to Professor Jin's handheld plant sensor. And so this is, a, this is an example, a prototype of the, of the leaf spec. And what the leaf spec allows you to do is it's a handheld system. It talks to your phone. It uses your phone to uh, the GPS services of your phone to understand where these data are being acquired. And then it actually allows you to collect a hyperspectral image of a leaf. And so you scan a leaf, it collects the hyperspectral data. You can incorporate algorithms into the data processing component that will uh, instantly prov provide information about either plant health or plant nutrient status or plant water status. Um, and it'll upload the data to the cloud and it'll actually um, tell you where the data was at. So it's, it's a way to, to collect large quantities of data um, with, the, with all of the metadata that's required to understand what do these data, what might these data mean from the standpoint of a, of, of a, bigger, of a bigger picture. 
one of the things that's special, and one of the reasons I really wanted to, to highlight this just one more time is that this, uh, this invention, the leaf spec, just a couple of weeks ago, won the 2021 Davidson Prize, which is, which is an engineering associated prize by the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. I think uh, there were three recipients of the David, Davidson Prize in 21, uh, 2021. One was Corteva, one was um, Agco, and one was Purdue. And this is really reflecting uh, the brilliance of Dr. Jin in developing uh, the leaf spec device. And we're really exploring opportunities to deploy that out into, into the world. Because again, the value proposition, it's small, mobile, and it provides um, an opportunity to collect these data without having to have all of the expense of having a platform. The last thing I, I do want to leave just a minute or two to, to for questions. So I don't, I'm not, I'm going to blaze through these, these slides, but we're now looking at opportunities. It's one thing to say we can do this at the agronomy farm or at Purdue. We're now looking for opportunities to deploy these systems and international programs. One of the programs that we're involved with, this is a project with Dr. Melba Crawford and Dr. Ayman Habib in civil and myself collaborating with cement and others in South Asia, developing heat tolerant maize varieties. Again, we have a system that's very much like the system that we've been describing as our sort of our base system. We started flying uh, experiments in India, which is a challenge just getting the sensors there. And the, I just wanted to highlight one thing, which is we're used to acquiring and processing data that have been uh, planted using a precision planter. And uh, one of the first things that jumped up was we acquired these data starting at mid-season. So we didn't have the early season day, the data to do row segmentation. And then we found out that these weren't planted, these were hand planted. And so they were, the rows and, and ranges are, are slightly off in terms of their angle, which is not surprising. It's not easy to plant a straight row if you don't know where your baseline is and you're doing it by eye. And so we actually needed to come up with new technology. This is coming out of Dr. Ayman Habib's work. And in fact, it's summarized in that paper I talked about earlier using the LIDAR data to find the rows and the alleys in the field. We did that. When you look side view down the, across the field, all of these low points are the alleys. And if you look down the rows, all the high points are the tops of the rows. And so you can use this physical information to identify or to create the shape file for the row segments uh, that are represented there. We use that information. This is a color coded uh, set of shape files describing the various experiments that were represented in this field. We develop a mask using the NDVI in terms of data processing. And then we can use those data to start pulling out row segment, which we would call a single row effect or combined, combined row segment plot level uh, um, spectral data uh, that reflect variation in, in spectral responses of plants under drought stress conditions. And what we found is that uh, this has been a really powerful data set to begin exploring. How do we, uh, uh, do we have the capacity using these kinds of data to start predicting variability in maize responses to drought stresses? The last thing that I want to say is it's uh, thank you for inviting me and Dr. Young to do this presentation today. It's been exciting to be involved in the Institute for Plant Sciences at Purdue for the last few years. Uh, we've been working hard to try to make it an inclusive group, not unlike the group that's uh, represented on the call today. So we have more than 100 scientists from five different colleges at Purdue that are working together to, um, to really engage our students and engage our faculty in our flagship research and education programs. And uh, we really want Purdue to be a place where we can work together to try to overcome some of the challenges that are represented in, in these sorts of uh, environments. And so I really appreciate the chance, having a chance to talk to you today. So I'm gonna jump off and try to take a few questions. Okay, thank you very much. Very, very impressive what the team at Purdue has been able to uh, accomplish. Um, there was a question uh, from Krishna Yagadish, and this goes back to the greenhouse um, um, question, uh, story. And the uh, question is, with so much structure in the greenhouse, how do you deal with differential shading in different parts of the greenhouse? Is the problem more on the sides compared to the center? And so I guess this gets to a case where you bring the, the sensor to the plant. Um, yes, actually in that case, the challenge of the sensor to plant mode is that you cannot, you can't even out the, the, the heterogeneity of the microenvironments. One of the reasons why we designed the AAPF the way we did, which was a, 
being able to randomize uh, the plants in the growth house, randomize the plants over time, because we're constantly rotating the plants to even out these microenvironment effects. Um, and a lot of that gets back to being able to address this environmental variability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from Suk Young. Are there some efforts to permanently store all these raw data along with the analyzed data? Yes. That's what we're actually, we're actually working with AGIT right now. And the goal is to, is really develop a database that allows us to jointly host both the field data and the controlled environment data. And so we've started off giving them, um, it's not the genomes to fields experiment, it's another experiment with 20 hybrids that were evaluated uh, it, uh, very much like the genomes to field study, 19 different acquisitions in the field. Plus we have uh, a year's worth of runs in the controlled environment. And we're trying to develop an infrastructure that allows us to um, to bring those two together. Okay. So a follow-up question for me on that. Um, so would that data then be available to other researchers if they want to try different methods of analyzing that the raw data? So we've done that with our as we in our Terra project, for example, we've actually come up with um, trying to think of what the structure of that data set is. It's a single year's data with the four or five or six acquisitions of process data. So we have the shape files sitting on top of those files. So you know where the plots are and all of the ground reference data set represented. And so this would be LIDAR and hyperspectral Wiener data and RGB data over time. And again, uh, we put that up in something we call the Purdue University Research Repository. And it has its own DOI and the intent is to provide others with a data set that they can explore and look at relationships and modeling, models and modeling and things like that. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Keshav Singh. Um, are you acquiring ortho, ortho mosaic multiple images in the greenhouses? And if so, how? I'm trying to find where you're at in the- um, It just came in. Came in. I see. At the bottom. Permanently store, thank you. Ortho mosaic multiple images. Are you able? Are you are you ortho mosaic multiple images acquired in your greenhouse? And so the ortho mosaic, uh, young. Maybe that would be a good good question. What can you say about the data processing inside of the imaging um, platforms, um, either, the, either the RGB or the hyperspectral data? I think this question more comes. I, I'm guessing this question is more coming from maybe the Gantry Dr. Jing's uh, system. Uh, I think that's a very good question. Actually, uh, to be very honest, I believe we use the same uh, principle uh, in terms of the um, uh, overlapping and uh, uh, searching for the uh, matching point in terms of catching the um, uh, features among images. And then we do the uh, image registration of the automatic, automorphic. Sorry for my English. Uh, but uh, there is a, um, a very similar uh, principle actually that we applied. Okay, a uh, question from Ruchi Bonsai. Um, so when you're looking at the controlled and facility and uh, uh, the field phenotyping, is the data received for a particular trait and genotype the same under those two conditions? That's actually the experiment that's ongoing right now. And I think in re, uh, we were very intentional about trying to have sensors collecting the same kinds of data in both environments. And so are the, are the, if the question is, do the genotypes look the same or do they express the same phenotype inside and outside? That would probably be, that's not a, I don't think that's a fair representation necessarily of what's going on. But if you're, um, if you're developing your model for predicting a trait, let's say it's for relative water content and you're developing relative water content models for diverse maze hybrids, as long as your training data in terms of the data that's being used to train the model includes both inside and outside data. So you have uh, the ability to have an inference in one versus the other um, and you explore how good those predictions are, that, that's, a, that's a pretty fair way to move forward. But if you take your inside models and you just directly apply those to corn growing at the agronomy farm or corn growing in Arizona or something like that, uh, that might be too much to ask of your model because it's never even seen those types of data before. And you wouldn't really know how well the, how well the prediction works. Mm -hmm. 
one of the okay. things that's really, one of the things that's really important actually that we found is to make sure that you're training your models on genetically diverse sets of materials that you can have a broader genetic inference for for prediction mm -hmm. yeah makes sense Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour. So uh, thanks, Mitch and Yang, for an excellent contribution to the field days. Very interesting. Uh, so the, uh, this has been recorded and will be available on uh, the AG2PI website. Um, so you know, point others you think may, may be interested in this to, uh, to, that, uh, <clears throat> to the site and um, to the recording. And there's also a Slack channel tied to it. So if you have questions, if anybody has questions, um, put those in the Slack channel, and then our speakers will uh, will will address them as they as they can. A um, couple of other things. Um, well, I need to acknowledge NIFA. NIFA is funding the AG2PI, so uh, thanks very much to NIFA for making this all all of this possible. Um, as it says on the slide here, if you have other topics for future field days, um, send them to us. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, so these field days every third Wednesday of the month. Uh, our next one in April will um, will be on aqu aquaculture, um, which should be very interesting. A uh, couple of other things. Seed grants. Um, they are due March 19, so coming up. So hopefully many of you are working on seed grants to submit. Uh, and then also uh, the, uh, there's a training workshop that starts tomorrow, um, and the topic is genotype to phenotype for non-biologists, and uh, Eric Lyons is, is leading that, um, the organization of it. So um, I think there's still opportunity to sign up. Um, so go to the AG2PI uh, website if you have any, if you're interested in that or have any questions. Um, yeah, so any, any feedback also on the, on the presentations or the field days, future field days, um, go to the website and, and you can send uh, our, your feedback to us through that. So with that, I think I've covered everything. Uh, Nicole, is there anything that I missed? Nope, that's pretty much everything. Um, I will just add that the Slack channel is not quite ready for this field day, but it, um, I hope to populate the questions, the excellent questions that were asked earlier. Um, into that so that everyone will um, have access to those answers again. Yeah, and also for past field days, there's no uh, a Slack channel attached to those. So they, you can, on past field days, if you have questions, you can enter those. Um, I think, yeah, it was very, in another very successful uh, uh, field day, thanks to Mitch and, and, and Yang. Uh, I think we had up to 76 uh, participants, but then of course, in addition, others will uh, look at the, or, or uh, reach out through the recording or look at the recording. So uh, thanks again. Thanks for everybody for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.